uh, Green Beret. Uh, so he spent his uh, career in U.S. Special Operations working as a Special Forces uh, soldier. Uh, he was uh, critically wounded, and Stephen will hit that in the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, but people like Joe, the, uh, the benefits when uh, you, you, you engage the autonomic nervous system by engorging limbs with blood and combining some kind of movement, whether it's um, a movement that the patient is doing themselves or movement that a therapist is doing for the patient. Either way, um, the benefits are pretty significant and Joe's a great, great example of that. Um, Stephen, the, the slideshow's coming through uh, pretty well. If you want to okay. uh, kick that, that piece off. Yeah, so you, you, those were, uh, these are all photos from Joe when he was uh, serving in various places. And um, he was hit by the bullet in his head, went through a Kevlar helmet. This is the, the bullet on the left. John, is this about the length of your uh, forefinger? Uh, yeah, that's seven, seven, six, two round uh, that you see on the left. And with you sharing, I don't know if it, people actually see me while I'm talking, but that round is about the length of my pointer finger. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Joe um, went into, he was leading a, a, a group of men. They, they were going into a uh, Taliban stronghold. Uh, Joe was up uh, standing um, up. Uh, John, what do you, you don't call it a turret. What do you call it when he's the uh, uh, standing yeah, he up? Was in, he was in the gun turret. So uh, the type of vehicle he was in uh, had a, a gun turret up on top and he was manning, manning that weapon when, when they were contacted, when they got in a firefight. And uh, this, this was, uh, he, he was shot, uh, he fell down the, or he, uh, and the medic was below him. He immediately did a tracheotomy. Um, nobody thought he was gonna live through the night. These are his um, colleagues just sort of saying their last goodbyes. And miraculously, uh, Joe lived through the night. Um, he actually uh, was in, after a period of time, I believe he was uh, comatose for um, six months and he was airlifted from Afghanistan to uh, the medical hospital in um, Germany. John, what, what is that? Where is that located? Uh, do you know? Uh, Launchstuhl, Launchstuhl, Germany. So they took him out of uh, probably, I believe it was Kandahar and from Kandahar to Launchstuhl. And um, that's where they stabilized him. And once he was stabilized, they flew him again to uh, Walter Reed. Um, in both flights, they didn't know if he was gonna make it. He made it. Um, eventually, he made his way to uh, Casa Colima um, in California. And he started Katsu about two years ago. Um, you see him here. Um, I, I believe this was from his uh, Purple Heart ceremony. Um, Joe's been in a wheelchair for, uh, I don't, maybe five or six years. Um, and um, uh, the um, two years ago, almost two years ago, he started Katsu and he's made remarkable cognitive and physical uh, improvements since that time. And he's actually right now doing Katsu. He just texted me and um, uh, he'll, he'll join us, but uh, as he's joined us, I want to sort of explain how uh, people in wheelchairs or people who are bedridden uh, use katsu. Uh, basically, what they do is the same thing that um, able-bodied people do. Um, in Joe's case, his right hand is uh, uh, normal. His uh, legs and his left arm are affected. And so initially, um, what we do is we use the band only on the left arm. Um, we do a number of cycles. Um, we do a combination of passive, 
passive exercises. So we move the limb and then he also moves the limb. Um, we do everything from uh, arm rotations, uh, bicep curls, the tricep extensions, uh, stretching the pecs, uh, the deltoids. Um, then we put both arms, both um, bands on both arms, do that again. Probably a combination of five or six cycles. Um, and then while he's sitting, we put the bands on his legs. Obviously, we take the armbands off, we put the bands on his legs. We go through a number of exercises and um, with the help of a, uh, his Katsu master specialist, David Towell, um, he even walks, he walks around his, his home. Uh, he'll walk outside um, and we just do this day after day after day. Um, and he's seen remarkable uh, improvement, but that's uh, Green Beret uh, Joseph Lowry from Long Beach, California. And um, he's right now working with his uh, caregiver, and hopefully he'll be on in a. Uh, Stephen, I oh, see Joe. Uh, he's go. he's on. He's uh, muted right now. Hey, Joe, can you can you hear us? Okay. We can't hear you. I can uh, hear you guys. Hey, right I'm on. Up with my arm, Katsu arm training right now. Yeah. So Joe, just, just explain to us how you use Katsu, uh, both in the morning and the evening. Well, I use it daily. I'm using it right now. And I think I overheard you telling about how I walk with this. I don't want to reiterate what you've already spoken about, but so I do it actively, but when I'm walking with my caregivers, my walking is still very labored as the therapists call it. I am precautions, my high fall risk. And um, so we'll, I'll train with the, the leg bands on walking, just regular walking. And it's really interesting because it feels like I'm huffing and puffing when I'm doing it. So I'm like, man, this is pretty amazing. And like my characters are just like, oh, it's just a casual stroll. But for me, it's, and I'm sure it's part of the whole process. Learn. John, are you listening? The arm training thing. So I've got a Sabo flex on right now, which opens my arm up, my left arm, which is the affected side of my body. And it uh, helps to relax the tone we found too. That's the biggest benefit to me with the cuts, one of the biggest benefits. Because of the neurological damage, there's something called non volitional tone in my muscles. So I have a spastic tone that really can be impairing for your ability to use the limb. Like my hand is always clenched in flexion, so it's balled up in a fist. I use the table flex device, which is open hand down. Let me get my caregiver to kind of help. Oh yeah, okay, that's good job. View. While I grasp the ball, use my own tone to And that thing should, in theory, open up my hand. Because what I was saying is, it's in my left hand, this tone keeps the inflection, so it'll be like this, the death grip. And we use the uh, katsu bands to just assist in the, you know, tax the training more. Got it. Hey, Joe, this, this is John. Can I jump in for just a second? Go ahead. Go ahead, John. Yeah. So when, when, when I saw Joe one year, so one full year after the incident, after the firefight, when he had been shot in the head, he was completely paralyzed on the left hemisphere of his entire body to include tear ducts, tongue, tasting, droopy uh, mouth, droopy eyelid, Obviously, all the neuromuscular pathway work on the left side of his body uh, was, was gone. And for some reason, and I don't know exactly why, but the, 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 the physicians and the specialists that uh, specialize in endocrine response and um, 
uh, autonomic nervous system response. For some reason, when you engorge that side of the body with blood and Joe's therapist were working and doing movements with his limbs, uh, he started getting the mobility back. So Joe, I just wanted to jump backwards in time a little bit so everybody understands that you had not a spinal cord injury, but a traumatic, traumatic brain injury. So significant, you had nothing on the left side of Absolutely. your body. Is that a fair? Just assessment? like a stroke victim. Yeah. Joe, go ahead. And then Joe, can you explain how you use this at night? How do you use katsu at night? As you call it, at night time, just to have the leg bands on and up really getting, I call it my bedtime ritual. Got my red light going and that's a whole nother rabbit hole to go down into the sleep. Just, it's very effective, I've noticed personally I think uh, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but the teacher David Lasau say how it. Oh, like, do you notice Joe? Carlson. Yeah, Dave. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But like and, and Joe, when you that too, I don't know what the science is behind it, but Joe, when you don't have the opportunity to you to use katsu yeah. before you sleep, what what do you, uh, is there any difference? I just noticed that, and when I was, had a Fitbit, a working Fitbit, I noticed my sleep cycles weren't as deep. I would have more disturbances in my sleep patterns. That's all I can really, because yeah. it's very, still very weird for me when I go to sleep, whether I'm dreaming or awake, it's like a time warp. Because I remember there's a, it's kind of, Story, but I told one of the neuro that he that um because they always annotate your sleep and he's like yeah how would you sleep last night I was like well I think I went at this time and then just you know I got up and for sleep you know sleep kind of like the coma I guess it's a blink a blink of an eye but it's always kind of a blur but I noticed big time that uh, on the nights when I don't have a chance to train with it or train, but use it passively, I'd be like, my sleep won't be as, the quality won't be there. Yeah, thank you. That I'm looking for, and I'm very adamant about good sleep patterns. Hey, can I, can I ask a question? Just, yes, um, I'm just curious if you know, where your lesion was was it premotor cortex on the right hand side or what, what do you know specifically where your lesion was from the uh from the injury um so my phone i gotta get a new phone and the speaker on it really sucks especially with the katsu going in the background you'll have to say that again while i hold the phone up to my head i i was curious if Ask you that. know can you hear me uh, yeah, go can, ahead. Do you know specifically where your lesion was from the injury? Was it right-sided pre-motor cortex, or do you know what area that was affected? Uh, um, it, yeah, because looking at my helmet that's sitting right here, it's the right frontal lobe. And then my therapist, one of my PTs at Casa Cleaning, was like, oh, that's why you have tone in your right leg. You have – it hit the motor cortex of the – through the helmet which i can kind i can see it from where i'm standing let me see if i can pan around if you guys want to see it and i know steven has seen it but did see you, if i can figure this out did you have much um as far as your facial stuff what, what sort of impairment did you have on your your the cranial portion your facial that you had john had mentioned some of it was it bilateral or was it was it unilateral? On the what? 
As far as your facial involvement, I know John had mentioned some of your taste and other senses. Was it more unilateral on one side or was it bilateral, your symptomatology from your facial component? So on my right, or excuse me, my left side of my face, I guess, is what you would say. From how okay. I understand it, because it, the damage was to my right hemisphere of the brain, it's all my left side. Correct. So I had the drooping of the mouth, and I cannot actively or independently close my left eye for, like, shooting. I discovered that while on a hunting trip. They had to put a pirate patch over my eye. And, I mean, I have the vision, the left field cut, as they call it, the neglect. Do you have a contralateral neglect? Uh, I don't know if he heard that question. That's all right. It's okay. Uh, but what I wanted to uh, emphasize is even if a, if a um, user is in a wheelchair, you can still, um, or wheelchair or is, is temporarily or permanently disabled, um, there are always ways we can use the bands. We can do it passively. So you put the bands on, do cut cycle, and then you or the caregiver or the therapist actually moves the limb for the individual. Um, and even if it's a stroke patient, even a slight movement, um, I mean, literally moving um, their forefinger or their fingers a millimeter or so. Um, what we've seen is um, the improvement uh, becomes cumulative. So if they can only move a, a fingers or limb, even one millimeter, by the second, third, or fourth time, um, they're moving in centimeters, in inches. Um, and so what we encourage is the more frequent the use, the better. What, what we've seen is sustainable is um, twice daily, uh, literally every day. And many people like Joe are very highly motivated to, uh, to do Katsu. And that's why when they have a device like this 2.0, um, they don't have to go to their physical therapy location. They don't have to go to the VA hospital. They could do it in the convenience and comfort of their home. Uh, in Joe's case, he has a caregiver who comes and helps him put on the bands. And what we did... Cots Global is we taught um, how to use Katsu to Joe's um, caregivers. So once they understood where to put on the bands and how to um, the degree of tightness, both on his arms and his legs and sort of the sequence, then we stepped back and, and they went forward. Um, and I think that's so extremely important for- Steven, uh, is he cycling? Yes, he's Still, cycling. I mean, is he just doing cycles and it looks like Based on the video I just saw, he's using bilateral upper extremity now, not just the active side, correct? Yes. So initially, just the active side, just the really um, tone uh, or uh, uh, focus on the affected side. And then w once you get it a certain degree of improvement, then we go ahead and do both. And, and we sort of, um, we sort of, we, we definitely fine-tune that working with um, stroke patients in Japan. Uh, initially, we were doing it uh, bilaterally. Uh, then we started to do it only um, unilaterally on the infected side. Um, and we saw the improvement, relatively speaking, was greater. Once they get to a certain uh, level, then yes, we do it on both sides. Anyway, today was is sort of the, the focus was how can you do it, um, you know, when you don't have the mobility um, of an able-bodied person. And last week we saw um, Dave Carlson go a, uh, a woman I, around 45 years old in a uh, in a wheelchair, moving her you know, um, in an unprecedented uh, degree. So. If there's any questions, 
Um, Even. Yeah. You didn't show the video 10 days later with her walking. Oh, no. I didn't. I haven't seen it myself. Um, she walked. Wow. Is there any way you could share that screen? I don't think I can share because I'm not hosting the meetings, but I can show you on my, I can maybe hold my phone up. I don't know if that is if you see the. Uh, let's see. So what next he, time, if it doesn't work, you can show it next time. Okay. So, okay. When, so when whoever, we, whoever is host, oh, I'm sorry, it's Kevin Parrott here. Whoever's hosting the meeting can, you can just click on David's uh, upper oh, that's right great. corner and you can give it to him if he wanted to. Yeah. Okay. Let me try that. Um, All right, Dave, I made you a co-host. I think you can, but Dave, if you could upload that video to um, your hard drive, you can actually then show it on, share the screen. Uh, by the way, hey, while, uh, while Dave does that, I have a question for, uh, for Joe, if, if that's okay, for yeah. Joe Lowry. Um, What's going Joe, on? Yeah. Hey, man, dude, really, really appreciate you joining us today. Hey, um, between that, that time when you and I first met or when we first saw, saw each other after your injury and you'd been in rehab for a year and you were completely paralyzed on your left side, between uh, then when you were completely in your wheelchair and now – how many steps would you say you're getting in uh, per day out of your chair in a cane now? 1,500 to 2K is the average. And that's only when I have somebody present with me to in that without therapy and this whole COVID crap. I mean, yeah. that was the average 1,500 a day. And were you completely wheelchair bound before? It's a rhetorical question. I already know the answer, but I'm really trying to hammer this home for the audience. I mean, a good bit of the time was spent in the wheelchair. And I mean, I was weighing in at a pretty hefty amount back in those days. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. I think I'll I have think to look they... through and find some pictures or something, do a comparison. <laughs> oh, that'd be sort of fun. If I didn't burn them. <laughs> um, I think Dave has the uh, um, his um, client up. Uh, just as a uh, put it in context, uh, this woman uh, mid forties um, has a lesion. Um, I'm not sure where um, in her brain um, she's in a she was in a wheelchair. Um, first time uh, Dave went over her home, her home, and she was able to move her toes and and uh, extend her legs. And Dave, go ahead, take it from here. It's 10 days later. Yeah, so I went over, by the way, hi, Joe. I haven't seen you in a hey, while. Um, so I went back over after 10 days and she hadn't done the, vid she hadn't done uh, the, the um, katsu since the night before, okay? And then so she was able to actually, um, she wasn't able to move this leg right here. You, got, you can see my cursor, I'm hoping. Yeah. Um, she was able to move her right leg before, but she was not able to move her left leg at all. And so she's showing me right now, um, 10 days later, that she can move her left mm -hmm. leg. And how high can you lift that right now? I don't think you guys can hear the sound. But okay, so I'm just fast-forwarding this long video. Okay, so she, she was... Uh, she explains how she would uh, prop herself up sometimes, but she couldn't bend over or do anything. But this leg right here, she could never move. But she's showing how she can bend her, her knee. Uh -huh. So she showed that. And then... Uh -huh. Nice. So this is... Okay, so then uh, she's actually going to walk right here with help. Mm -hmm. Dave, we can hear it good. We can hear it. We oh, can hear it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, have a little bit more balance. Mm -hmm. And, um, not balance. I think it's my balance. Holding me. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. But before, if I wanted to move my legs, uh -huh. 
As she had said before, if they prop her up, she has to pull her leg. She'd have to pull her leg like that, now, but she could prop herself up. But she was definitely not able to do this and walk. See how she's moving her left knee? She's mo actually moving her left leg. Remarkable. She's, she's super excited. And one of the things that Steven said that helps is she is super, super motivated. Uh, she wants to walk again. So, she, so I'm going to go back there sometime next week. I'll get some more video. But she's adamant about she's going to walk again. The first time she got to even feel her leg move, and if you, were, if you saw the last Zoom meeting, when she's able to move left and right, um, uh, I asked him, I put my phone, my camera on uh, John, and I said, when was the last time you saw her be able to move her leg like that? And he said, over five years. And she only had the katsu on for about 15 minutes and then I had taken it off when she was able to move her uh, back and forth, her, her, her uh, foot. So, you know, this is, this is I'm a rookie with, 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 the, with the katsu, but I keep working with people like this and just it's crazy. David, did you, did you just use cycling or did you use cycling and training? No, just cycling. Just cycling and I'm low. And um, the first day that I did it, and I put this, put it on her. She was in a, uh, you know, she was in a wheelchair. I put it on on both legs, and it was around the third cycle. Um, she interrupted me and started moving her toes. She hadn't been able to move her toes in in five years, over five years. And then, and then, if you saw the video, then all of a sudden, um, I, you know, I stopped and I was talking, and then she goes, John, you know, that's her husband, John. Look, and then she's lifting her foot up, and then, and then she starts crying. Right, so I start videoing and she's crying and she's able to move her left foot left and right. And he's like, he hasn't seen that in 15 years. Now, the next day when I went to go drop off, uh, when I went to go bring them their actual Katsu bands, that they, the 2.0 unit, uh, she was really excited to put it on because at that point she couldn't move her leg again. It had gone back to being what she called dead. And so um, I showed up and she's like, oh, let's put them on, let's put them on. So she put the leg bands on and I put them on, on the first cycle, she started to lift her foot up. So the first day, it took three cycles in before she could move her toes. We did, I think, four cycles, maybe five. I took the bands off, and then in about five minutes, she was having th being able to move her ankle and stuff like this. The second day, when she tried it, on the first cycle, she, was all, she goes, hey, look, John, I can already move my leg. And then 10 days later, when I showed up, um, I said, oh, have you done the katsu today? And she said, no, I should have, but I didn't do it since last night. And I said, do you have any movement in her leg? And she had a uh, good uh, mobility movement in her leg. And that's just after 10 days. Um, and, and one of the things that Steven said is, you know, she is younger. Um, she's actually, she's 49 and she is um, uh, highly motivated. So Steven was telling me that it's, it's, it's easier to wake up her body uh, because she is, she is younger and she's, She's determined to walk. Hey, Dave, this is, this is John. Quick question for you. Um, could you go backwards just a little bit and tell us what it is, her, her initial injury? She has, she has multiple sclerosis. And so um, I'm, I, don't, I, know, I don't know a ton of, about the disease, but the way it was she explained it to me is that she's got lesions that grow on her and that um, disrupt uh the communication from her brain to her like hand like yeah. like you know when i when, when i want to make a fist you know i i i'm thinking i want to make a fist i can make a fist but on her she's thinking she wants to make a fist but it's with her left leg but some the lesion is blocking the communication Got uh, it. but some of you guys that are doctors would probably be able to uh better okay no that, 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 that it's, explains it's thank you if I, I might be able to uh, explain a little bit of this, David, and that some of the tests that we did um, with Katsu and showed that the muscles not only become in exercise or due to hypoxia, they pump, they become pumps. So I, I talk about people who exercise, their muscles not only get pumped, but they become pumps. And they actually start putting all of these molecules out into the blood. And some of these molecules are really important for neuronal function, and especially for actually MS. So people with MS have a, what's called a demyelination of their motor neurons. It's like the outer coating of, the, of an electrical wire, of the rubber, of the insulation 
um, gets uh, removed and then they're able to short circuit, which is the problem that they can't get, the brain can't communicate to the muscle anymore because the wiring is basically short circuiting. But the plasmalogens, which are put out by the muscle, uh, help protect uh, people, those neurons, those motor neurons, and, and restore the membrane function. So it's really, and because people with MS can't really exercise, their muscles never really get into a position where they can become pumped by exercise. So what Katsu can do is it tricks the muscles into thinking they're exercising to some degree, and they start putting out these chemicals, which are, or chemicals, molecules, which are very important for all membranes in all cells, but especially important for neurons. And what I would think is happening with this woman is that the transient, because Steve came to the shop here and we did these tests, and there is this spike of secretion of these uh, plasmalogen molecules into the blood, which could temporarily help either her muscle function itself, the muscles, or the neurons. And I'm just amazed and think this is fantastic. You know, this really needs to be dug into. Uh, just so everybody knows, uh, this is um, uh, Dr. Kevin Perot. He's from Novato, um, California. It's about, what, 40 minutes north of the Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County. And um, Kevin and his team are a wonderful, wonderful addition to the Katsu family. Um, they do some very groundbreaking um, uh, experiments and are really pushing the boundaries of what we know. Um, say hello, Kevin, to everybody. Hello, and, everybody. Uh, Sorry, I was late. Uh, what we do and what we Kevin has done is we take a blood sample, um, then we do katsu, and then we take a post-katsu blood sample. And Kevin and his team are able to uh, document and, and, and uh, compare the before and after. Again, it's a very simple test, but the more and more we work with Kevin, the more and more he's able to share with us um, anything specific. And so uh, we have Dr. Glenn Page on the other side of the country um, in Virginia. And Dr. Page, if there's any specific um, uh, element, uh, metabolite um, that you are interested in, Kevin could really delve into um, something very specific that you may be interested in. So um, maybe what I'll do after this is I'll, I will connect um, Kevin, you with uh, Dr. Glenn Page and, and um, um, Dave Carlson, who's the um, uh, Katsu specialist who is helping this woman and others like her. He mm -hmm. and his parents who are both in their 70s will go visit Kevin next week, do a pre and post uh, uh, blood analysis. I just, if, if, I, if I can just uh, quickly share a screen of the, of the before and after results with the katsu. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe you can yeah, enable, I'll, uh, enable me to do that and I'll show everybody. Come on, there you go. It's really quite remarkable. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. And, and this has never been done before in history, basically. But it, so here we have a, this is all of the results that we got from Steve's in the initial preliminary tests. But in particular for multiple sclerosis, there are molecules called sphingomyelins and the neurons have a myelin sheath. And it is the destruction of this sheath which causes uh, the malfunction of the motor neurons. So here we see the blue bar is before each of these represents a, a different version of a sphingomyelin, but they're all kind of related. And the blue bar is before katsu and the orange bar is after katsu. And basically the, the take home message is just that these sphingomyelins after katsu go up by at least 20 to 30%. Some of the species don't change, but a bunch of them do in the positive direction. So, then this is, this is the same story for other molecules as well. So everybody knows that exercise is good for us. Uh, people who can't exercise don't actually have the benefit of exercise. And you know there are some benefits of exercise that I think Katsu can, can recapitulate for, for those folks. Yeah. 
So that's, um, that's it. Yeah, no, Kevin, that's, uh, can you, uh, there's two or three other slides there that all- Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Me. Can you go through those two for the benefit of uh, yeah. everybody on the call? Absolutely. Okay, so, um, so actually here, yeah. So this is basically metabolomic shifts due to blood flow moderation using katsu. Uh, this is for people who don't know what katsu is. This is the analysis that we do. And basically, we extract a whole bunch of molecules and they eventually <laughs> turn into data. Um, this is a good control because it tells us that before and after katsu, your fatty acids don't really change. So this, is, this tells us that, you know, it's what we would expect for before and after katsu as far as the fatty acids in your blood go. And we, that we were just pulling, we, we measure hundreds of things. Some of them will change and some of them don't. These are produced by your microbiome. Uh, and although they seem to go up a little bit, they're not significant. So this is kind of like another control. These guys don't change. Um, triglycerides don't change. The ones that actually, the most important ones, the ones that are potentially associated with the sleep effect that um, uh, Joe was talking about are, are these things called plasmalogens. Now this may be a little too small for you to really see much because there's so much on here. But basically again, the blue bar is before katsu, the orange bar is after. This is a family of molecules called, uh, they're all for the cell membranes. And this is one, one version of a cell membrane molecule. This is another one. And they're two different families. But the take home message again is that they all go up after katsu for the most part some of them and the plasmalogens here in the center are the ones which are associated with uh, maintenance of cognition in older individuals and for sleeping better and a whole bunch of other neuronal functions. So if they're going up uh, transiently, uh, you're get, it's like getting a dose of a bit of a sleeping uh, agent. Um, so that's the plasmalogens. Hey, Kevin, can I ask you a question about that real quick? Um, sure. Do you find, have, you, have you noticed that there's a cumulative effect in any of these people that are repeat? And number two, if there is, um, is it additive over time and how long does it last? This is a, these are all fantastic questions. The only work that we have done with Katsu is with Steve. And so what this is what I'm hoping to do with, with in the future is we can start looking at, you know, how long does it take? Cause we know that people can overexercise. Do their muscles, you know, maintain the ability to, you know, put out the, these kinds of molecules. Does it change with age, with injury, a whole bunch of things. Um, so no, I can't answer. Those are good questions. And you know, the cumulative effects versus, you know, how long it lasts. And these are all, questions that I would love to work with Steve and everyone else to answer. But what we do know for sure, 100%, is that when you cause the stress, hypoxic stress to these muscles, or if that is exact, if that's what's happening, they start secreting a whole bunch of signals to the body, which uh, probably, we don't even know for sure if, this has never been done in, in uh, ever in science, which is kind of weird, but everybody's looking at diseases and not just general function with these tools. So, yeah, so we're going to continue to work with uh, Steve and love to, you know, have more conversations on how to get to the bottom of some of these benefits and how long they could last in maximizing them. Uh, what else is there? Oh, the ceramides was something that I think John, one point, uh, maybe it was you who had mentioned that you had been particularly interested, or there was a doctor that we had been introduced to by Steve. So the ceramides are actually not something that you want to have high for chronically long periods of time because they are markers of inflammation. But for a short period, they are markers that kind of show you that your body is undergoing a, a regenerative process because inflammation is associated with regeneration. So the ceramides also go up. So the, mu the muscles are doing that. And these phosphatidylcholines, 
you know, where the, we really don't have a ton of understanding of the biological function of some of these molecules. Uh, but measuring them and finding out that they change is the first step to knowing that they're important or potentially important. So this is really totally green fields, uh, never really been looked at. Um, triglycerides uh, actually do tend to change a little bit before and after. So this potentially means, but it's different, different triglycerides go up and some of them go down and nobody knows why. So, you know, this, this, what we do get when we do these kinds of measurements is an awful lot of data. And if there are reproducible changes, we have an awful lot of questions. And so we're, we're left with some very intriguing uh, directions and a lot of work to do. <laughs> it's basically where we're at. So, and Donna, uh, so thank you very much for letting me share that, Steve. No, that's great. And um, Dr. Page, if, if after this brief introduction by Kevin and, and seeing the um, Joe and then Lucy, that was the woman um, who was walking, uh, if you have any ideas um, what direction we should be headed and have access to uh, patients who want to experiment with us, uh, not with us, with, with uh, uh, Kevin's uh, assistance and guidance, that would be great. No, I'd be happy to. Uh, Kevin, let's, we can hook up an uh, email and, and connect and uh, brainstorm. That, that would be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a question for, for Kevin, if that's, a, if yeah. that's okay. Go ahead. Quick question. Um, I noticed that myself and my parents haven't been sick once since we started doing the, um, doing the katsu. And I was wondering if uh, any of the levels you were looking at in Stephen's blood, um, I was looking at something, I'm not a doctor, the phagocytos phagocytosis, I think it's called, mm -hmm. the professional phagocytes. Sure. Uh, that do, is, is there an increase in the professional phagocytes? And, and what about the T, the T cells and stuff? Yes. Did you notice yes. any of that? Well, we would have had to have measured those types of things at the moment. And at the moment, all we've done is just measure molecules. We haven't looked at cell function. So those kinds of assays are a bit more involved and require lab equipment and culture, cell culture, and tests to see whether or not they're more effective at doing their job. Um, but that is, I think we can safely say that these molecules which are put out by exercise as well as katsu and uh, your cells under stress sort of give an overall system alert to all the physi all of your body's systems that they are uh, there's some stress and they need to get better at doing their jobs so um, there's basically two modes that your body can operate in couch potato mode or hungry and running around all the time looking for food mode and most of the time our bodies are not in the hungry, running around food uh, thing. And that's where our DNA is very, very happy. Um, it's happiest. Um, so our, our immune systems tend to shut down when we have all the food that we want to, and we're not under threat. So our, our, our systems tend to go lazy. Whereas these molecules basically tell all of our systems that there's some stress and they need to get busy. And so I wouldn't be surprised at all if there are some positive immune effects on, on the system. Um, but we definitely need to look at, you know, what those are. There's like 300 molecules that we measure and the literature uh, we would need to search. I mean, there's a lot of work just even looking at what we know about these molecules and matching that up to what kind of function is. I think ceramides and sphinx are certainly associated with um, immune responses, and a bunch of them are associated with immune function as well, to both white blood cells and T cells. But what they, hard to say, long-winded answer, sorry. Thank you very much. No, it's, Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. So it sounds like you're guessing that yes, it does increase. We don't know, guess. but uh, we don't know, but you know, I would be, flabbergasted if you know the same signals that 
you know, exercise can do uh, that because exercise is a general overall, you know, thing. And if basically we're dealing with the same kind of signals that exercise produces, we're going to see similar positive effects across the board. But to definitively answer that question wouldn't take too much, but it would certainly be, and it would certainly be publication worthy. The one of the, one of the things that uh, I really collaborate, you know, really surprised at all the time is just how little cats has been around for many years. And there has been, hasn't been an awful lot of real good digging into how, what its effects are. And, you know, it has the potential to benefit an awful lot of people for cheap. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe there's just not really a ton of enough money to be made to attract the attention of, you know, big business. Um, but it's also up to us now. I mean, once we know these effects and we can see that people benefit, um, boy, this, this should be a total all out, you know, all hands on deck. Let's figure this out and get it into as many people, get as many people on it as possible. Because older people, younger people, everybody could potentially benefit from this, especially if they can't exercise. Hey, hey Kevin, real quick, I talked to John and I talked to Stephen about this, but while you may be correct about there's not big money in it for certain people, where I foresee this being a big win-win for everybody, especially patients, is if we can get insurance companies to buy into this and do some studies with this and help reduce, you know, their outlay and cost, not only in, you know, medications and treatment, yeah. but more importantly, yeah. increased productivity. I mean, totally agree, Glenn. Yeah. Totally, totally agree. I'm cynical. Um, I'm very cynical about the system and because if it's not pharmaceutical oriented, if it's not a drug, um, you generally don't see. But I think there is an opportunity, it's like a wedge. And I think that if people start benefiting and you can start showing the benefit and the cost savings and a whole bunch of things, there's a whole bunch of people that will push for it. But how do we get it? We have to give them the data that they need to use as ammunition against the other people who only want pills and all the rest of it. That's just my cynical view on it, but <laughs> I totally, I totally agree though. All right. Well, thank you very much. So Kevin, this is great. We'll hook you up with Dr. Uh, Glenn Page. You're going to see um, Dave Carlson and his parents next week. And um, this has been a wonderful time. Thank you very much, Kevin, for sort of putting a lot of- uh, uh, Totally awesome. Out there Steve, it's, it's amazing. We have the possible, I am just, Open Cures is probably says it all. You know, I'm all about helping people help themselves. And because I think we can do things a lot faster when we do that. <laughs> so, so, yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me, having me here. Oh, pleasure. All right, everybody, I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm recording this and then we'll have this uh, available to all of you just in case Kevin said a lot of very profound things there. Maybe use some terminology that you're not aware of and I'll give you some time to uh, do your own research. Thank you very much. John, you have anything? Uh, just a special thank you to, uh, to Sergeant First Class Joe Lowry uh, for joining us and telling his story after being shot in the head, which uh, <laughs> those pictures of Joe being given his last rites and his whole team saying goodbye, their final goodbyes to him. I get choked up every time I see that. And uh, Joe, you're just an in incredible inspiration. Keep doing what you're doing, brother. Thank Congratulations. You. All right. That's all I got, Stephen. Joe, I'll see, I'll see you in an hour. <laughs> all oh, right. yeah. Take, take care, guys. All right. Bye. And ladies. Bye. Bye.